It's great to be with you. Thank you for taking the time to join us at DevX World this year. Glad to. We're, we're thrilled to have you and congratulations on the book. I want to just dive right in. You, you, know, you have a funny moment in the book where you talk about how you really predicted the last pandemic, but lots of people didn't pay attention until after this pandemic hit and suddenly millions more started watching the TED talk that you gave. This time you've come out with a book on how to prevent the next pandemic. Hopefully more people are paying attention. I can tell you the people here in the global health community certainly are. And one of your big ideas I just wanted to start off with, which is this idea of a germ team. It's the global epidemic response and mobilization team. Maybe just tell us a little bit more about that. You've been at the forefront of creating new global health agencies like CEPI and Gavi. Is this, is this how we should think of it? Is it like a new global health agency? Is it another acronym in the global health architecture? No, I don't think we should create something uh, that's separate from the WHO. This is, uh, it could be that it's slightly uh, kept special, but it's a piece of the WHO. You know, WHO, you know, declares pandemics. WHO's in a position to make sure people are practicing. Uh, the key point is that if any country uh, doesn't get the right resources, then a disease can go global. And so unlike a lot of stuff the foundation does where it's about health aid to help developing countries, in this case, even if it was just for the rich countries alone, the idea of stopping outbreaks before they go global uh, is a great investment because it prevents the you know incredible loss that we saw in this pandemic, and you know the next one could have a higher fatality rate. So, it, like you see in the movies, the WHO should have a group that stays dedicated and is available to jump in, particularly to help countries with limited capacity. And WHO obviously presents challenges. It's 194 member states. It's different than some of these other agencies you've helped to design and set up, which are more like public-private partnerships, are a little more fit for purpose. Obviously, you've thought through those trade-offs, and you think the credibility that the WHO brings is so key to this that they have to be in the driver's seat for germ. Absolutely. Uh, it's countries working together with other countries. And so having it be, you know, the country saying, hey, you're not practicing enough and that's creating a risk for all of us or boosting that global capability so that, uh, you know, they can respond immediately. The big problem with pandemics is that they don't go global very often. And so it's easy, even for an incredible group like CDC, they didn't keep the the a team dedicated. And so the question of, okay, how do you scale up diagnostics very quickly, which could have been done, you know, didn't happen during those first 100 days that are, are very key. And so by having this, this team, we would always be ready and they'd make sure every country was participating. A lot of the focus on our lack of readiness was around vaccine delivery. There's obviously the supply question, but you, you focus a lot on once we even had the supply, did we have the cold chain set up or did we have messaging to governments to say, hey, this is what's coming and be ready for it. What do you think broke down there? What, where, where, did, where did our global health architecture kind of fall apart when it came to getting vaccines once they were produced into the hands of people who needed them in low and middle income countries? Well, the first point is that you don't want to have, you want to stop outbreaks uh, when they're fairly local and then the vaccine question doesn't come up. Having that vaccine capability in case you do have an escape is super important. And you want vaccines that are infection blocking and you want a lot of them very quickly. Um, given that you have finite manufacturing capacity, the likelihood that the rich countries, uh, the leaders will feel huge pressure to get access to those vaccines, you know, it's it's doubtful you'll have a perfect allocation. The allocation was was closer to just than for many diseases because the richer countries have most of the people over 60, and you know that's where the the big death rate was. But it was incredibly unjust. I mean, old people in uh, say South Africa 
should have gotten vaccines before young people in the United States or even uh, than in India. And so it's always tough when it's, uh, you know, shutting down all of society. Uh, the ideal is to just get the capacity up so that within a very short period, you can make enough for the entire world. Um, you know, we want to have more locations, including over time some uh, in Africa, but the overall capacity will help you achieve the ideal since, you know, it's not clear people are going to uh, ignore their voters um, in terms of how, how they let the vaccine get distributed. Yeah, we knew vaccine nationalism was a thing before COVID, but we really saw, you know, what, what it's like. And I guess that's why a lot of governments now say, hey, we want to bring manufacturing capacity for the next vaccines into their own borders, right? And I wonder what you think is a realistic plan. You know, are we going to have vaccine production capability maybe in Senegal, Rwanda, South Africa, or are we going to really realistically see it in many, many more countries than that? Where do you think we should be aiming to go? Well, the world only had one factory, which happened to be in the U.S., that was a standby factory, uh, Emergent Biosolutions, and they managed to completely fail to contribute uh, in a timely fashion. So, you know, I'm not sure standby factories are, are such a good idea. The vaccine market is very diversified. That is, uh, to get super low prices, the Gates Foundation has funded uh, places like Brat, BioE, Biopharma, and Serum to have all the key vaccines. And that's why the Gavi prices have gone down dramatically. You really want to have enough supply to get low prices and not so much supply that you bankrupt all the vaccine manufacturers. And, you know, so we are investing in new modular techniques uh, that make the capital cost of having a factory a lot lower. Uh, in fact, Melinda and some foundation people were in Senegal this week looking at uh, the expansion plans they have there. Uh, they've been making yellow fever vaccine and now they're adding several more and increasing their capacity. So I think if, if we're careful on this and make sure we have an architecture that works in the years where there's not a pandemic, but can also work in the years when uh, the next pandemic comes. You know, I think we can have huge capacity, um, you know, include Africa more and more over time. Uh, but it's not, it's not easy because people are very picky about vaccine quality. They're not like, oh, it was made in some wonderful country, so we don't need a good regulator. Um, you know, making sure like that the Chinese regulator becomes a world-class regulator, that'll help get more supply in. And so we invest in regulators in Africa and many places to enable this sort of global picture and, and low price uh, co cost for Gavi and others. Yeah, and, and you know, you bring up that architecture again. I, I wanna ask you about the Global Fund in that context, right? Because the Global Fund has been trying to fill this gap, um, you know, they're they're vertically oriented, but in the end, they think about health systems just like you do, and you and you see it all as one thing. They're now trying to fill some of this pandemic preparedness gap. Is that the right place for the global fund to be going? And how would that work vis-a-vis -vis this germ team that would be part of the WHO? Yeah, global fund is is for funding country plans, and they've developed expertise in their three key diseases: HIV, TB, and malaria. And now. Um, helping with health systems, including <clears throat> for pandemic preparedness. They're not the global surveillance epidemiologist uh, data modeling group that we need to resource WHO uh, to have. You know, I love the Global Fund that, you know, Gavi and the Global Fund are two of the greatest partnerships uh, that the foundation has been part of and have had huge impact. We'll see at the September uh, fundraising for Global Fund, how much more than the 14 billion we got three years ago we can get. Um, you know, it's challenging and all these aid budgets now face uh, uh, real pressure because of 
refugee costs and food costs and overall budgets, you know, with Ukraine, you've got defense costs, electricity subsidization costs, and we're still digging out of debt levels and problems that uh, the pandemic has presented us. So these are challenging times in terms of uh, uh, keeping the aid to global health uh, at the, the levels that it, it needs to be. Yeah, and on that point, I mean, in a way, the model for global health for the last 20 years or so, and you've been a pioneer in this, is kind of leveraging, using private dollars to leverage governments to do the right thing on, on certain disease areas, let's say. Is that era, era of kind of leverage ending now with, with aid budgets getting so cut back and with governments just saying, you know, these are not the places we want to go? And is, do we need to move maybe to a new moment where private philanthropy says, even with the challenges around credibility and legitimacy, you know what, we're just going to fund directly at a higher level in these areas. Because everyone leveraging everyone at some point, maybe there's just not enough there left. And pandemic preparedness seems like an example where governments just have not stepped up, even given the very clear warnings you and others have given. Well, since pandemic preparedness is a benefit to the rich countries, it shouldn't be thought of as aid in any way, shape, or form. It's part of either their defense budget for bioterrorism or their health budget, uh, you know, to prevent the, the, the deaths. And so certainly private philanthropy isn't there to help rich countries uh, do that work. I mean, we can get involved to some degree, but of all the things that they should fund, you know, they've seen $14 trillion in cost. And whenever we've had world disasters in the past, like World War II, we actually, you know, governments came together to, to try and prevent it happening again. So even though it's been slow, uh, I'm still hopeful the governments will come through. There's no way private philanthropy has the scale or the legitimacy to fill that function, nor can private philanthropy, you know, fund that high a percentage of the global health needs. That is, is rich country aid budgets. Uh, you know, we're, the Gates Foundation is like, you know, 6% of global fund, um, you know, we're like 12% of Gavi. Uh, we're fairly big in the upstream R&D piece uh, right there with the US government or sometimes even more, but on the delivery piece, the, you're, you're never going to fund that without the generosity of the rich governments. I mean, so many other wealthy families have not gotten into this philanthropy game in the way you are and nowhere near the scale. What do you think is holding them back? I mean, I'm thinking about your, um, your at least a one time next door neighbor in Mackenzie Scott and how, how massive her philanthropy has become overnight. What do you think of that approach? Do you think that might help get other philanthropists out to do, to do bigger and bolder things? Where do you think we are? I mean, you, you founded the Giving Pledge with Warren Buffett, and still it's only about 10% of the world's billionaires have signed up to it. What's needed to get us to that next level? Well, I, I think philanthropy will continue to increase, but you know, these are individual decisions uh, that people are making, and you know, they need to connect with something that they understand and that they say, see very high impact. Uh, giving Pledge you know, is encouraging people to do bolder things, do more, do it sooner in their life. Uh, but, you know, these crises we're facing right now, uh, you know, philanthropy is only going to scale up at a, a gradual level. So it's not, in no way is it a substitute for, for government money. You know, the global health work we've done is very fulfilling. And there are lots of areas, things like neglected diseases or some of the key innovations that I do hope a lot of other philanthropists come in uh, because, you know, per dollar, the global health work, uh, there's this whole movie movement called effective altruism where they compare and, you know, global health uh, comes out as very much uh, one of the highest impacts again and again. But a lot of effective altruists, while they certainly believe in funding global health, don't want to seem to fund Global Fund, for example, you know, or Gavi. They don't, they don't seem to want to fund the big institutions, which has been such a key part of your strategy. 
What would you say to them about what they're getting wrong about, about funding those institutions? You know, there's, we have so many ways that people can contribute to global health. Uh, we have the end fund, you know, where if you even give 5 million, we can say which disease in which countries uh, you're preventing or eliminating, and you can go and see that. You really need people to have a hands-on feel. Uh, Global Fund is getting better at going after philanthropists, but even in their, uh, you know, high hopes, it doesn't get to a huge percentage of of the money. Um, you know, obviously, I I help with that as much as I I can, but things that are overseas when people look at you know, civil war in Ethiopia and, uh, you know, the dysfunction. It is uh, easier to see giving at home. And so it's always going to require, you know, traveling over there and, uh, you know, some getting on that learning curve. And we're trying to help as much as we can with that. I remember being with you at the UN General Assembly when the sustainable development goals were put forward. It's now we're at the midway point. Uh, of this 15 year period. And obviously we're way off track. Your goalkeeper's effort has talked about how much we've been set back. Do you think it's gonna be possible to get back on track for, for 2030? You no. gave an example of Ethiopia. I mean, so what do we do? What, what should uh, the, all of us in the global health, global development space, what should we be thinking about when it comes to the SDGs and our, our approach? Well, you know, like on childhood deaths, uh, we should feel incredibly good that that number's gone down from 12 million a year at the turn of the century, now below 6 million. The goal, the aspiration, I should say, in the SDGs was to cut it in half again to 3 million by 2030. That did not uh, assume that there'd be a war in Ukraine or a pandemic or even a turn of the economic cycle, which you know we, we don't know yet how tough that's going to be. So we will not hit that 2030 goal, but every life saved has value. It's not like, you know, 3 million and one and 4 million are the same number. Uh, and we will get there. You know, is it pushed back all the way to 2040? Well, that depends on generosity, depends on innovation. Uh, hopefully we don't have more of these big setbacks uh, in store. Uh, because you know the the poorest countries tend to um, get pushed down the agenda when you have you know a pandemic in other countries or you know the war and so you know the next five or ten years our SDG project progress you know may not be that great but you know every little bit counts you know avoiding reversal reversal is uh, super important as well. And so, you know, we can't just despair or look away from uh, what needs to be done. And speaking about, you know, things that can come up that will maybe hit us on the SDGs, what about the food crisis? What is your current thinking on that? Um, do you feel like it's going to be a full-blown global crisis that affects a lot of the countries we're talking about? What's, what's your understanding of where it stands right now? Well, it's a, it's a disaster for Africa. You know, when you have a shortage of edible oils, some people get none. When you have a shortage of fertilizer, some people get none. And it creates urban instability. So you can have gigantic setbacks. You know, subsidized bread is a big thing in 12 countries in Africa. So, you know, you, can, you could say there may be more deaths in Africa through the malnutrition and loss of food than even in the war zone itself. So yes, it's an acute situation. The 10-year goal has got to be to raise African agricultural productivity so dramatically that even in the face of population growth and climate change, it becomes a net food exporter and it doesn't have this huge dependency that it makes it a gigantic victim of this war. I remember when the SDGs first came out and you were asked kind of a skeptical question, I was moderating a session with you about them. You said, hey, what about innovation? That's the thing that's going to get us out of this. Is that still your, your basic orientation? Yes, I'm a, uh, pretty predictable on that point, uh, since that's where you know, I try and add value. And you know, I think having seeds that can deal with the high temperature, 
uh, and require less water and are dramatically more productive. I, our key here, I think, you know, vaccines for malaria and HIV are key here. Uh, so, uh, yes, the reason I'm still hopeful, not about the near term, but about the general trend of improvement is because we can surprise people with great innovative tools and then be innovative about how we get them delivered. Well, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic is an important book. It has a lot of those innovations in it. And it's a great way to kick us off today at DevX World. Thank you for being a part of it, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.